Good day and welcome. I'm Michelle Lavander, Editor of Reporting on Health. We're continuing our effort to introduce you to core concepts in data reporting and data research. Earlier this month, we hosted a webinar on Excel Basics for Analyzing Health Data, an introductory course that you can find on Reporting on Health. Today, we'll be learning about visualizing healthcare data using new online tools built by journalists for journalists that make it easier than ever to bring data alive. Our guide today will be Becca Aronson, who develops news applications and works on special investigative projects for the Texas Tribune. Becca was a founding member of the Tribune's news app team. She also has focused a great deal of her data work on health and healthcare delivery, including her wildly respected 2013 project as a National Health Journalism Fellow with our program, focused on women's health and abortion politics. The ease with which we can now visualize data has a downside. It's easy to get it wrong and make it look pretty at the same time. Becca will be sharing some practical tips and offer her wisdom about ensuring that we portray information accurately. It starts with asking the right questions of the data. If you have two screens, you can watch Becca's work and follow along on your computer, but we've intended this webinar as more of an introduction than a hands-on workshop given the large number of participants. Please keep in mind that we will also record this webinar so you can return the archived version on Reporting on Health to Review and download the PowerPoint with all the tips and links included. Before we get started, I wanted to share a few operating procedures. We'll hear first from Becca, who will give a 45-minute briefing, then we'll open it up to your questions. Because we have several hundred people participating in the webinar, we'll ask you to comment in the question or chat field in your control panel. If you have questions about sound or other things not working, you can send us a message there too. We'll also be posting links to the resources that Becca shares and we'll upload her entire PowerPoint afterward. We will archive this webinar afterward on Reporting on Health. Should you want to tweet about this webinar, the hashtag is Health Matters. Thank you and now we're going to turn this over to Becca. Hi everyone, thanks for joining me today. Uh, my name is Becca Aronson and I'm co-leader of the Textrunes News Apps team. Um, when you guys see the presentation later, I encourage you to watch this little video. Um, it's a great start. Um, first I want to talk about accurate representation. So as journalists, when we're visualizing any kind of data, we have an obligation to ensure that it is accurate just as we do with our stories and anything else that we publish. So when you're working with data, we need to make sure that our visualizations don't mislead or misinform our readers and that they actually convey the correct story and message. So I'm a really big fan of the phrase uh, interviewing the data. Just as you would a human source, you need to look at um, you know, how accurate is the data that you're working with? You know, when, when interviewing a person, you would think, how reliable is this person? Can I trust what information they're giving me? What bias might they have that's reflected in their account or their opinions? Um, we have lots of ways of answering this question. You know, we might say, oh, they're an academic or expert in their field, so I can trust them. Or they have paperwork and documentation that backs up their account of what happened when they were in the hospital, so I can, you know, trust that that's a reliable source. Um, if you know someone works for a policy firm, they might have a particular agenda or, um, you know, a bias that would influence their opinion. So you really need to take into account all of those same questions when you're looking at your data. Um, and make sure that you can really trust, you know, how do these people collect the data? How did they analyze it? Do they have an agenda? And could they have put some kind of spin on the data to make it seem a certain way? Um, go back to what data they were originally using. So let's say you're talking to a policy firm and they send you a press release um, that has a very specific message from the data. Ask them, okay, did you use census data for this? If you did, did you collect your own data and merge it with this? Um, if you did collect your own data, how, what were the questions you were asking? How did you analyze it and put it all together? You really need to make sure that um, the data is trustworthy. So census data is a great source. I use it all the time. It's pretty neutral. 
Um, and it has a lot of really awesome demographic information that can be the starting point for a ton of investigative stories um, and looking at health trends and things like that. But even census data kind of comes with its own assumptions. So here's a really good example. Um, the census data clarifies race and ethnicity separately. So if you're looking at race, Latino and Hispanic isn't one of the categories. Um, that means that people who may identify as Latino or Hispanic are most likely to put themselves in the white category unless, you know, they consider themselves half black, half Hispanic, and then they put themselves in the black category. So if you're doing a story that's looking at, you know, the demographic breakdown and you're only looking at race, not ethnicity, you might miss the influence of a large Hispanic or Latino population in that area. So the census data accounts for this by having in its categorization of ethnicity um, non-Hispanic whites. Um, and, you know, it kind of like breaks up the white population based on that subcategory of ethnicity to identify people who see themselves as white and Hispanic and people who see themselves as just white. Um, so you need to look at the data and kind of dig into how it's being collected and organized to make sure that when you're actually using it, you're going to be telling the right story. Okay, now let's talk about what happens when we actually get to visualize data. The lie factor. Um, this is a, toy, a, a term coined by Edward Tufte, who is kind of the guru of data visualization. Um, I recommend if you're actually getting into doing more data visualization that you read some of his books. Um, but the lie factor is basically saying that every graphic should have an accurate representation of the data um, when you make it visual. So the effect that you show in the graphic should be equal to the actual effect that you see in your data. When you actually calculate this, it should be, you know, a value between 0.95 and 105, basically 1. So let's look at an example. This is a graphic um, that's showing the fuel economy standards. So on the top we have this little line that's like about half an inch long, 0.6 inches long, representing 18 miles per gallon. And at the bottom we have a much longer line, 5.3 inches long, that's supposed to represent 27.5 miles per gallon. So we're going to calculate the lie factor. Up here we have the actual physical representation, the inches and the difference between them, and here we have what they're representing. When you actually calculate this out, it's 14.8 because the perspective of, <laughs> of this line is not equal to the, um, what they're actually trying to show with the shorter line. Um, so this is actually an incredibly misleading graphic because it makes it seem like this is a much bigger difference than it actually is. There are other ways to accidentally um, misrepresent the data visually too. So, here we're looking at the percent of doctors solely devoted to family practice. And here's the graphic. I've added this graphic so you can kind of get a sense of the difference. The percent of doctors solely devoted to family practice is a one-dimensional data point. It's just a percentage. But here on this graphic, we have this percentage represented by the area of this doctor. So when they made this graphic, they made the height of this doctor relative to the percent of doctors solely divided, devoted to family practice. But when you stretch that graphic out by height, you also change the width, which means that this graphic is now representing half of the entire graphic, even though that's not an accurate representation of how you know, the percentage is actually changed. So you need to be really careful when you're working with graphic designers that they also know um, these basic principles of how to accurately represent your data so that you don't mislead people. The other factor that you need to take into consideration is design variation. Let's say that you are putting two graphs right next to each other and one of them has an axis that starts at zero and another one has an axis that starts at 400. The reader might not necessarily see that at first, and you could mislead them into thinking that these are directly comparable graphics. So here's an example. This graphic has a lot of problems. <laughs> One of them mainly is labeling. Um, 
it's unclear exactly what this graphic is trying to show, but I would assume that it's trying to compare the percentage of measles outbreaks that cases um, for the measles outbreak in 2018 that happened in Brooklyn compared to the rest of the U.S. So they're trying to show Brooklyn as a percentage of the total U.S. population and then the number of cases of measles compared to the total number that happened in Brooklyn. These things aren't directly comparable. So it's really hard to see, you know, the ratio of this population compared to this ratio because this is a pie chart and this is not a pie chart. Um, also, it's not labeled. So how do we even know that we're really supposed to make these assumptions that I just laid out to you? It's really difficult. Um, a better way of doing a graphic like this would have been to either show both as pie charts or both as kind of these um, breakdowns of, of percentages through little dots. I would assume the reason why they wouldn't want to do this is because this tiny little sliver would actually be not even a full circle, and so it would have been really hard to compare. Um, but these are things to keep in mind when you're trying to build infographics and making sure that your design you know, tells the right story. Um, these are the six principles that Tufti puts together for basic data visualization. We've gone over the first one, which is the life factor, and making sure that um, the physical space represented in your graphic is directly proportional to the data um, that you are trying to represent. Uh, making sure we use clear labeling and making sure we're using the design to show the variation of data, not just putting in you know, bells and whistles to make a fancy design that doesn't actually show the data. Um, when you're working with money, make sure you always do uh, show inflation so that you actually are showing a trend. That's pretty important. Um, it's really good in general to normalize your data, making sure that you take into account the total context, um, whether that's the total population or you know the, the breakdown of like if you're looking at a subgroup, like let's say you're looking at um, some trend by racial categories. Um, if you don't compare the actual total number of people in those categories to the event that you're looking at, then um, it might be really hard to say whether or not it's a direct proportion. Um, and yeah, you shouldn't quote data out of context. So population maps. People really like making maps. It's, you know, one of those go-to, let's make a map. And sometimes maps are really awesome, but sometimes they're not. <laughs> Sometimes you can use data and it just ends up looking like a population map. So let's say you're looking at the total number of people with heart disease and you're comparing LA to the rest of California or its nearby surrounding areas. If you just use the quantity of people who have heart disease, then of course LA is going to look like there's a lot more heart disease in the surrounding areas because there are a lot more people in LA who might have heart disease. So you really need to find a way of putting that number into context, either by bringing in the total population and calculating the percentage of people that have heart disease, um, or finding some other way to make sure that you're actually giving the context of what a number is and not just showing population map. When you go through this presentation again, I highly recommend you go through um, this lightning talk that Darla Cameron did. She's from the Washington Post at the 2015 NICAR conference. Um, and she gives a good demonstration of different ways that you can tackle data instead of making a population map. There's also a great article linked here um, on when maps shouldn't be maps and when you should do other things with your data that would be really great. So here's what I was talking about um, in terms of looking at raw number versus percent. This is a map of Texas where um, I'm from, so I do lots of maps of Texas. And if you look at the raw number of children under 18 living in poverty, you'll see that of course, you know, Dallas-Fort Worth in this area, Houston right here, San Antonio right here, El Paso, these are high density population areas, so of course they have a greater number. When you change it and you make it by percent, then you see actually there's a bunch of counties down in South Texas that have a higher percentage of children under 18 living in poverty, and in East Texas, and you start to see some more nuance in the data that you might have missed before. So let's take a look at my fellowship project. Um, here's a couple examples of things that you can do with data. 
So here's a map looking at the number of women expected to receive primary care services um, from a state program that they implemented to help women receive women's health services. You can kind of select by region and see particular details. You can also click on the map to change where you're looking at. Oops. Um, Here's another one. One of the common things that healthcare reporters that we like to look at is access to care and the number of providers. Um, when you actually put providers on a map, though, it can look like a thousand little dots. And how do you differentiate which providers actually care for patients, like, and which providers are just on the list, or whether those you know providers take a bunch of patients or just three, um, <laughs> or account for the population in the area. Maybe there's a bunch of doctors available in you know, a high density population area but not rural areas. So this one looks at the five or six main health programs for women in Texas and we've grouped where the providers are to show the density of providers in a particular area and you can see pr pretty quickly at a glance which programs have high coverage and which ones don't. And next to this, we explain the women, the number of women who are enrolled, how much funding each program gets, how you have to be eligible, and you know why some of these programs are, are different than others. Another map that we've done that was really effective um, is looking at the Texas remaining abortion clinics. So as you may recall, Texas passed some pretty strict laws um, limiting which types of facilities could actually perform abortion. So we made a map that shows before these laws, when the laws kind of initially took effect and all of these changes were happening, and then after these laws took effect, the number of available clinics. In this case, a map is really effective because we are showing the exact locations of these places, um, and so it really helps visualize the change. Another pro, uh, project that I highly recommend you check out is ProPublica's series on how much is a limb worth. This is great for a number of reasons, um, but what I really like about it is it encourages you to engage with their data. And the more you can get your users to engage with the data, the more they're going to learn. So this project looks at how much different states pay, their workers' comp system for the loss of various limbs and um, other body parts. And you can make direct comparisons. So let's say you're in Illinois and you can compare losing an eye to the national average. You can also change the state. And they have you know, a visual representation that changes size. So I highly recommend you go back and um, play with all of this and check it out. Most likely, though, what you're going to be doing um, when you get started is putting graphics and charts inside your stories. Um, so here's an example of one little chart that I made to go inside a story. Basically, by embedding graphics like this, you can just enhance the story and help tell it in a different way depending on you know what kind of audience you have if they relate more to seeing something visually versus reading um, and also kind of give a little bit more detail into what you're talking about. So in this case we were looking at um, payments from the federal government to Texas for uncompensated care. We showed a breakdown of what type of hospitals they go to and then we emphasized that the majority of this money was going to urban safety net health systems so you could look at those main um, districts and see how much money they got. And then we went a little bit deeper into one of them, the Houston area, and looked at uh, you know who's paying for care and how their specific costs are broken down to emphasize what would happen if they lost this extra money to cover uncompensated care. You know, this is um, a story from a, a while back when Medicare released data on um, the number of doctors paid by Medicare and how much they were paid. So we just made a table of the doctors that were most billed or that billed the most money. Kind of just enhances the story. 
Oops. <laughs> So now I'm going to go through um, and show you guys how you guys can do this on your own. Um, there are two tools that I recommend to get started with, and these are Data Wrapper and Chart Builder. Data Wrapper was built by Danish journalists for journalists. Um, one of the main people who built it now works at the New York Times and has developed an internal tool for them to do um, this kind of chart building, which is really awesome, and I wish it was open source. Um, and Chart Wrapper, which was, or Chart Builder, sorry, um, which was built by Quartz, and they have a really great tool called Atlas where you can preview a bunch of examples and see how they're using this tool. Um, they're both pretty great. Um, Data Wrapper, you need to have a subscription to embed this, the, the graphics with the interactive functions. Um, so, you know, that is something you should take into account. Chart Builder is completely free, but it only produces an image. Um, so that means you would embed the image into your story, but it doesn't have as much flexibility in terms of interactive functions. So let's start there. Okay, so let's pretend that we are writing a story about Los Angeles children. We want to talk about how poverty is impacting the children living with disabilities in the Los Angeles area. And according to the data which we got from the American Community Survey, which is um, aggregated by the U.S. Census Bureau and is pretty reliable, um, we found out that a greater proportion of L.A. children with disabilities have incomes below the federal poverty level in the past 12 months than children without disabilities. So. I'm going to go through all of these steps, and I encourage you to go back and do it yourself <laughs> afterwards. Um, we're going to go to Chart Builder first and click on the Chart Grid in Step 1 and delete the default data. So here's what Chart Builder looks like when you go to the main page. They kind of give you an example. We're going to highlight and delete all of that data and click on Chart Grid instead. This is just to get us set up and started and ready to go. Then we're going to open up this spreadsheet, which I've already prepared to make it a little bit easier, and copy the data and paste it into step two. So the data is under the worksheet under 18 poverty level. So here's the worksheet under 18 poverty level. And we're going to copy this data, go back over to our chart builder, and paste it in. And look at that. Now we are on our way to having a graph. Um, as you can see, children with a disability have a higher um, percentage below the poverty level compared to children with no disability. Um, at this point, if you wanted, you could change the colors. You could also experiment and see what would this look like as a line chart. Oh, that's not an accurate representation of my data. Um, you could also change the number of rows and columns. So we have two separate charts, right? That's because we made it a chart grid. So we could say, actually, I want to have two, and I want to stack these like this. Here we can add, on step four, a prefix or a suffix. So if we're working with money, we might put a dollar sign in here. But these are actually percentages, so we're going to put a percentage. Um, chart Builder only will put the unit on the first number, so in this case it looks a little weird because there's only two numbers, but don't think that you've done anything wrong. This is just how it is. Um, you can also change the minimum and maximum levels of this um, if you want to change the dimension. So that way, that's saying the maximum would be 100. Um, down here, we can add a title. Um, probably a better title than that. Um, and you would want to always put the source of your data. So in this case, we use 2013 American Community Survey data. Now when you reach the end of it, um, oh, these things will change the size. 
unfortunately there's only some a few preset things. There's also some you know issues with the fact that because it's leaving room for this label, this is cutting in here and up here. You know that's just a limitation of this tool, um, and it's unfortunate, but that's just kind of how it is. Um, now you can download this as an image or as a scalable vector graphic, which means it would be responsive. Um, that means that it would change size as the person changed their browser window, which can be really good to um, use. But you can also just have it as an image and put it in your story. And that's this tool. So if you're going back through here, here's pretty good step by step of what we just did. So let's take a step back. Um, I gave you guys pretty clean data in this spreadsheet, but I want to show you guys how I actually did this in case you're doing this on your own and it's a little bit more complicated. You would download the raw data from the American Community Survey. So this is what that looks like on the American Community Survey. Um, it looks really nice and neat, and you would go to download, and you would download it in a single file and say OK, and it would generate your file, and then you would download it. So when you open that file up, it's going to look like this. That's pretty confusing, right? They've given it these codes which help you kind of identify what's what, and then underneath it, they tell you what those codes stand for. So this also goes all the way over here, looking at all these different age groups, and we don't want all that information, right? We just want to look at children. Um, so to make it easier for you to visualize, I've highlighted the, the ones that we actually want to use. And I would copy these um, from here, all the way over to the one that I want, it's just this one. I would copy this, and then I'd have a new spreadsheet. And so here I've already done this, but I would right click, and under Paste Special, I'd say Transpose. This is going to make it easier for me to see, right? So now I have all of that data and I'm going to sort it, go up to this little arrow at the top, and I'm going to say I want to sort this by A to Z. We'll get rid of this. Oops. And now you can see all of our data right here. It's a lot easier to work with. So now we have the number of children 5 to 17 years, the number with no disability, the number with no disability and income at or above the poverty level, the number with no disability income um, below the poverty level, and these are for all for children 5 to 7 years and then below down 5 years and under. So we need to add these up right and calculate them, calculate the things we want to put on our chart. So I've created another spreadsheet called Calculations, and I've pulled over the fields that I want to work with. These are the estimates, and I've organized them here by um, disability status. And I've put together on another page, Calculations Blank, um, if you're doing this by yourself, here are all the headers that I set up to kind of keep myself organized. So if you are doing this on your own, you can start with this sheet, copy it over, put it in your own worksheet, and then pull in the data that you want to work with, and you can do these same calculations. So here we want to say, okay, the number of children with a disability below the poverty level. So we need to add up our two age groups, right? So we have with a disability below the poverty level under five years, with a disability below the poverty level five to 17 years. Just using the formula equals this number plus this number. Next to that, we have the same two different age groups, but without disability below the poverty level. Again, adding them together. Same thing here and here, but for the other groups, right? But we want to see these as percentages. 
So here we have a little bit more complicated of a formula. Um, we are taking the total number of children with a disability, adding them together right here, and we're finding that as a percentage of the children below the poverty level, because that's our category right here. And we're multiplying it by 100 so that we don't have a decimal number, and then I'm rounding that. If that's complicated, here we can go through it together. So, oops. Here is the percentage. Here it says 0.47%, right? But when we visualize this, we don't want to say 0 0.7, 0 0.47. We want to say 47%. So I'm multiplying it by 100. So we get 47, but that's 0.18962058. So let's round it, and we add this extra formula round, and say I want it to go to one decimal point, and now we get the 47.2. Oops. You can go through each of these and see how we did that. Here are step-by-step -step instructions so that when you go back through this, um, you can do it on your own. Here's a screenshot of the data fields that we pulled over when we transposed it into a new worksheet. Here's our blank space for doing our own calculations. Here's the raw data that we pulled in. And now here's an example of how we're calculating these things and adding them together, and then calculating the percentage. So now that we have our data, let's try the other tool. Data Wrapper, if you have a subscription, you can sign up, but um, you can also use it without any subscription or login. So let's just go in this top corner and we'll click New Chart. Great. So this is the blank uh, Data Wrapper. It comes with some, um, some templated data so you can kind of get a sense of how your data should be formatted for different types of charts. So here's an example of something that they would give you just to play with and try out. But we're going to go back to step one. So in this case, you can either copy paste your data like we did with um, Chart Builder, or you can upload a data file. Either way. This time I'm going to use the, um, the raw estimates. I'm going to copy it, bring it back over, paste it in. So here we can see our data. I want to edit this because it's given it a temporary title because I had left that blank, right? So let's say actually this is poverty status, or disability status, sorry. Once your data has been uploaded, you can edit any of these fields just by double clicking them and opening it up. So you can also change these titles. Oh, I think so. Well, also if you cl click on the column header, you can do a few things. Um, you can round your numbers once you're at this spot. Oh, here's the rounding, um, or divide them. You can also, again, add a prefix or suffix. So if this were my, we could add a dollar sign, um, or if it were percentage, we could add a percent sign. You can also say, actually, uh, I don't want to include this column, and just click hide. And that means when we get to the next step where we're visualizing it, it won't show that category. This is helpful if you're bringing in um, a data file that has a few different extra things that you want to see but you don't want to actually visualize. So here's a chart that it gives us just for starting. Um, this one has a little bit more interactivity. You can click back and forth between these two things. But if you notice, you know, it's really hard to actually see anything with these two columns, right? Uh, just 
the relative quantities aren't such that you can actually see that much of a change visually between these two groups. So let's start here and say, okay, well, if I make this a bar chart, well, same thing, right? So something cool about Data Wrapper is that you can go back to your data and you can click Transpose. Now when I look at these things, you can actually see a bigger difference, right? That's because we're looking at, you know, comparing children with a disability, the percentages that are below and at the poverty level to children with no disability below and at the poverty level. It's actually more closely what we were showing here, right? But here we're using the raw numbers, but the changes in, you know, the relative visual between these two things is actually showing kind of the percentages. Um, so that's pretty helpful. I highly recommend when you're playing with this tool, though, that you go through and just kind of check out <laughs> all the different things that you can make and say, well, is this one the best thing for my data, or is this, um, you know, there's lots of different ways you can do it. So let's say we're going to do it this way. There's all this extra space down here. Um, I want to get rid of that, right? So I'm going to change the size of my graphic down below it. It says resize. Now I have, you know, a new proportion. If you keep going under refine, you can change the colors. You can even customize it so that each one is a different color. That's pretty terrible colors. <laughs> a little bit better. Um, and there's a few other settings, you know, you can automatically sort them. Under annotate, you can add a new title. You can also highlight something. This is going to make that bold and say, this is what I want to point people to see. And down here, because we, we brought in that example data at first, it's already put in a source. But we would want to put our source. 2013, oops. And with this tool, you can actually link directly to your data. So this is where we got that data, right? Here's our data. Put that in there. Now, when you're ready, you can hit Publish. To actually use this data or this graphic, you're going to need to create an account. Um, data Wrapper, when they first started, had a big grant, from, um, and they were able to host everyone's charts for them. But that grant money ran out, and so now they ask people to pay just so they can host the graphics on their server. Basically, it costs money to, um, you know, store these things and, and keep them active. Um, so you can either download this um, and get the raw HTML and have someone like a data techie person at your publication help you put that on your own server, your own publication server, and then use it, or you can pay to have them host it for you. Great, and so here are the instructions for when you are doing that on your own. Okay, great. Um, and that's all for the basic presentation. Um, and now I'm available for any questions that you guys might have. We have one question from Rose um, Hoban asking, what are some of your favorite data sources? One of my favorite data sources? Um, I guess it kind of depends on, <laughs> on what story I'm doing. In terms of basic demographic data, I love using the American Community Survey. Um, it can be a little bit complicated to figure out at first, um, but it's a great tool. Um, they have 
information that they track every year down to the census track level, but you can also see things by city. Um, if we look at that tool real quick, you can get a sense of all the different things that you can um, see under topics. You know, they have people, you can see disability, education levels, income levels, whether or not they have health insurance, their marital and fertility status, um, relationships, poverty, it can get really detailed. Um, and so it's a great starting point for getting neutral or fairly neutral data to provide some context to either another data source or, you know, maybe you're looking at a cancer cluster and you want to see just kind of general information about the people in that area, um, things like that. Uh, it still sometimes needs to be, you know, investigated. You know, uh, you might see something that looks kind of suspicious or interesting or trendy and you're like, wow, that's interesting. Um, but you need to find people to interview and actually ask to find out some of the stuff to make sure that what you're seeing in the data, um, what that really reflects. Um, other sources in Texas, I really like going directly to state agencies. Um, our state health agency keeps a lot of Medicaid information, which uh, as a former healthcare reporter, I found very useful. Um, I think that you just need to investigate, you know, where data is kept in your state or your region and you can get access to it. A lot of times the best way to do that is to um, call people up or uh, and see if you can talk to people who manage the databases at those um, state agencies, the people who run the programs. Also, um, looking at forms. If you know you're looking at a certain type of, like let's say, a healthcare provider, and they have to submit certain information to your state or your city every year, finding the form and seeing the information they have to submit usually is a good indicator of what the state or that entity is actually collecting data on and tracking. So that's a good place to figure out what people have too. And uh, Becca, we have a question from Catherine uh, Binamu saying, have you used interactive data visualization graphics? And if so, which programs or models have you found to be most useful? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess, can, there's a lot of different, um, I mean, the tools that I demonstrated today are kind of the easiest ones to get started with. Um, an older tool that some people still like to use is called Mini Eyes, um, and it was put up by IBM, and that's really good. For a lot of the more complex stuff that you might want to visualize, um, you're going to need to know how to program and code. So if you can find people in your newsroom and you can collaborate with them, um, that's a really awesome way to get started um, and just watching how other people build things. Um, I guess, is there any more specifics about the question? Like exactly what she's looking for? I'll see if she replies, but for now let's maybe move on to another question. This is from Don Sapatkin who asks, in what situations would you show confidence intervals or margins of error in a graphic? That's a good question. Um, the census data comes with margin of error and it's useful for you, I think, to show, you know, to get a sense of the statistical kind of like flux in the data. Um, but it, when you, it's actually, you know, the way that they, they use it is it's kind of like an arc, you know, like the high and the low range are, are possibilities, but like they've given you the middle of the arc and are pretty confident in that number. So I think for you, if you are looking at a, a data set and you're seeing that, you know, that margin of error is like so extreme that you're not comfortable telling the story with that data, then don't use the data. Um, but actually showing it to the user, um, you know, isn't necessarily that valuable because um, you want to get across, um, you know, a, a point that you are confident in making. So I think in terms of your analysis, it's something that you definitely need to take into account and consider. Um, but in the actual visualization, I think that you need to tell the story that, you know, is most relevant and direct. 
And uh, we have a question from Patrick Pine who says that the, the presentation has focused on U.S. data and do you have any suggestions about international comparisons and sources? I will admit that I don't really do a lot of international um, data work because I'm based in Texas um, and so I do a lot of like very regionally focused data work so um, I don't think I have a good answer to that one, sorry. And another question um, from somebody who says that um, she loves the American Community Survey and is constantly using state uh, HHS data. Is there anything else you use, some other federal data? And are there other non-governmental data that you've found helpful? Um, well, in terms of governmental sources, Medicare is really good. Um, I think that a lot of universities have really awesome data, and so depending on your region, you know, finding people in academia who are doing work on the kinds of things that you're interested in is really great. Um, recently, or I guess last year, we did a project on the oil boom in Texas, and we worked with researchers at the University of Texas in San Antonio, and they had collected all of this great information, and you know, we were able to to use that and start from there. So you know, finding experts in the field and seeing, you know, who's tracking the types of things you're looking at is good, but there isn't necessarily a specific go-to source. It's really project dependent and you just have to do your research. We have a question from Andrea Moroskin who says, if you're showing change over time, are there time intervals that you would recommend, five years, ten years, twenty years, etc.? Again, I think it depends on the data. I mean, it's, uh, it's hard to, you know, some data only goes back so far um, and you need to look at the actual trend, you know, is, is this something that is changing every five years or is it, you know, for 15 years it was going up and then all of a sudden it started to go down, you know, you need to look at what is the trend I'm trying to show and how can I accurately visualize that. Um, you know, if you have a very short term amount of data, like only five years, then you need to make sure that that's actually a trend and it's something that you can show over time and not something that is more of a, a quantity of like, this is just the amount of people in each of these years or the total number of people in this five year span. Um, because sometimes if you have too short of a time period, it's not very um, accurate to say it's a trend. And um, before I ask the next question, I just want to emphasize to everybody that we are recording this webinar and we're going to have it on our Reporting on Health webinar page along with the PowerPoint so that you can access it later. Um, Catherine Benamu, who asked a question, broad question earlier, became a little more specific in a reply. She said she wants to develop a graphic that will show different levels of data complexity or variations among urban locations working with the same variables so the online reader can shift back and forth to view and compare these outcomes. So what would be the best um, tool for that? Um, I think, honestly, just a little bit of JavaScript. She should find a programmer who can help her build something. Um, JavaScript, so the way the internet works <laughs> is there's three main different types of code. You have your HTML page, which is, you know, the stuff that you're seeing. You have the uh, CSS, which is kind of like the makeup. It's the stuff that makes everything look pretty and stylizes things and arranges it on the page. And then you have JavaScript, which creates interactivity and allows you to manipulate and change what's happening on the page. So if you click a button, something will happen. Um, basically, if you're making a graphic like that, you would just want to use JavaScript to pull in all the different um, data points and then have a button that lets people select, you know, the area that they want to look at or put in their address and find themselves and, you know, that's a little bit more higher tech and you would need probably to learn how to do that or um, talk to a developer who knows how to help you. So Amy Trent asked the question that I've been dying to know the answer to as well, which is what mistakes have you made with this that we can learn from? Yeah, um, I've made lots of mistakes. <laughs> um, you know, when I was talking earlier about um, providers, um, you know, showing too much complicated data doesn't actually help 
anyone. Um, finding a really simple message and trying to communicate that is a, a lot better. Um, also making sure that you're not too technical, like data a lot of times comes with really um, wonky ways of describing the information. So trying to put it in human words um, while still being accurate, describing, you know, like these are people below the poverty level, not 12 months income below the federal designated poverty line. You know, that doesn't really mean as much to people. Um, so making sure that you can give it a human touch and also simplify the information for people. Um, it's good if you have very complex data to show a larger message and then get more granular and detailed um, so people can dig in to see how it's relevant either to their particular community or area or region um, and kind of keeping it pretty simple. This is the sister question to the one asked uh, a moment ago from Brent Jones who asks, what is the biggest mistake reporters make working with data visualization folks and what is the biggest mistake data visualization f folks make working with reporters? I think that um, it's the same mistake on both sides. It's a lack of collaboration. Um, uh, reporters need to know when they're talking to a person who does data visualization for a living that they have a level of expertise and so the original idea that you're coming in with may not be the best way to actually showcase that data and you need to take into account you know, what that visualization expert is telling you. At the same time, the person making the visualization needs to be mindful of the story. You know, what is this reporter actually trying to convey? And there needs to be good collaboration to make sure that you guys are working together to tell that story because um, that is always the foremost important thing. Um, I think, you know, in general, you know, reporters might be, in some cases, um, think that they already know the story, but the data doesn't actually support that story. It doesn't tell the same story that they found in their reporting when interviewing humans and talking to them about what's happening. And you need to be okay with that. You need to recognize when your data isn't telling the story you want to tell. Maybe you're not looking at the right data source, or maybe there isn't data to support that story, and maybe you need to change directions. And um, Chris Newby asks, what is your favorite map tool? Um, mapping is interesting. Uh, when I'm actually doing analysis, I really like using this tool called QGIS. Um, it's an open source version of ArcGIS, which is a really expensive and awesome and wonderful program, um, but very expensive. And so um, QGIS is like its um, open source sister. <laughs> Um, and this is the tool that I use to merge geographic data with other data, maybe do some analysis and say, okay, show me the regions where the percentage of people with this factor are highest, and I can kind of do my reporting, like visual reporting, kind of do that kind of analysis. When it comes to actually presenting the data, though, um, QJS is not the right tool, and I like to use Mapbox. Um, which is um, a pretty well-developed platform that merged with this um, other tool called Leaflet, and so you can create a lot of interactive features, um, and there is really great documentation and examples online of how to actually build things with Mapbox. Um, so those are the two things that I recommend. Um, I've also heard, though, that Google's API is incredibly easy to use, and they've made lots of improvements. Um, and it's also a tool that has lots of documentation and people online doing cool things with it. So if you do, you know, want to try something new, I always recommend Googling it first and seeing, like, <laughs> what have other people done? And a lot of times there's step-by-step -step instructions or people who have encountered the same problems that you've encountered, and Google can tell you the answer. So. And we have a question from Patrick Pine saying, immigration is such a hot topic, and especially in Texas or other states in the border, and there are many competing claims about immigration, immigrant use of health services. Do you have an opinion on the reliability of data regarding immigrant use of health care? 
Um, that's a hard one because I don't know exactly what data you're talking about. Um, I think for any kind of data, you need to look at the source. So if the data you're looking at is coming from a policy firm and that policy firm has an agenda, then I would question them on how they calculated those numbers um, and do a pretty thorough interview process of how they collect this data, what are they looking for, and then find someone across the aisle to say, okay, I got this data, this is how they told me they collected it and analyzed it. Um, do you think that they're, you know, missing something? You know, are they not taking certain factors into account? Um, just do some regular old bootstrap reporting and figuring out whether or not the data source is reliable. We have a question from Rose uh, Chiota saying, can you recommend any patient level health data sets that can be obtained without problems over privacy issues? I'm thinking it would be the hospital discharge data, but maybe there's something else that, that you would recommend. Yeah, the hospital discharge data is, is you know probably pretty good. Medicare has a bunch of data um, that's good. I would also say um, if you're you know in a particular region, asking the hospitals. Um, a lot of the public safety net hospitals are pretty good at tracking information and they can give you things that um, they have for their specific area. Okay, and then also just a question, could you repeat the name of the mapping tool that you mentioned earlier? Yeah, so the mapping tool that I use to do my analysis is QJS and it's the sister of ArcGIS which is um, a little bit easier to use, but a pretty expensive tool. And the tool that I like to use for visualizing maps and actually publishing them is called Mapbox, M-A-P-B-O-X. Um, and it's pretty good, but also Google and the Google Maps API um, is something to look into as well. Okay, and then we have one more question, which is, um, She's from uh, Rose Hoban. She said um, she notices that you're looking at ACS data. Are there other little known metrics that they collect? Uh, maybe there's a data source that we don't all know about. Um, well, I mean, if you look at um, the American Fact Finder, um, they, you can look at um, under topics. You can see all of the data sets that they have. Um, a lot of this is demographic based, but some of it is also, you know, business and other other items. Um, I would say a lot of it is little known because they go down to a really granular level. And so if you have a question about anything, you should just look there first and see if they have it. Um, it's pretty expansive. So I think that we're going to have to come to a close. It's almost 11, and um, I want to thank you so much, Becca. This has really been so fascinating, so informative, and I want to remind everyone who's listening that we are going to be putting up the archived version of this webinar on reporting on health as well as the PowerPoint. And also, just to remind you that we typically send out a very brief survey after the webinar to ask for your feedback and to encourage all of you to take a moment and fill that out because it helps us tremendously. Thank you so much. We're going to sign off now. Thanks.